Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. Most people on YouTube and in the mainstream press are unwilling to hazard a guess as to what will happen on Monday. Caucuses are pretty unpredictable, and the Iowa caucus in particular has a long history of having some pretty surprising results. People don't like to put themselves out there and take a risk by making a guess on what will happen. But I'm not most people. As Scott Steiner famously said, I'm not normal. So what I'm going to do is actually make a prediction for what will occur on Monday. I will first lay out my case, and hopefully you will at least see my reasons for thinking what I think, even if I turn out to be 100 million percent wrong. So also feel free to come back to this video after the fact and make fun of me if I did fuck this up badly. Anyway, let's just get on with this and go on with my prediction. The rules and mechanics of caucusing are both archaic and arcane. So let's go through those basics first, and then this will sort of set the stage for how I'm making the prediction that I'm making. In Iowa, there are 1,678 different caucus sites that people meet at. These can be things like high school gyms or libraries, etc. And then there are 99 satellite campuses for students who are out of state or service members abroad or what have you. In each of these meeting sites, people will get together and vote by literally going to stand for a candidate. Or I guess in the online one, they probably click a box or whatever it might be. The result of that night technically will be electing 11,402 county delegates. And then those county delegates will elect state delegates. The state delegates will then allot the 41 pledged national delegates. There are also eight super delegates if the convention goes beyond the first ballot, which is deeply unfortunate, but we weren't able to get rid of super delegates altogether. And some districts, there are different rules for achieving viability. Viability in this context means having enough of a percentage to warrant getting some county delegates. If you're in a fairly large precinct, you need about 15% or more to get a delegate or two. If you're in a precinct which assigns three delegates, you have to get a minimum of 16.67%, which is a strangely specific number. If you're at a precinct where they only allot two de delegates, you need at least 25%. And if you're in a precinct which only gives away one delegate, you have to have 50% or more of the vote, meaning that only one candidate will get anything out of it. So if it ends up being 52-48, at the final tally, well, the 52 win the whole thing. So um, this system is a bit complex and a little confusing, but this is how it basically works. Now let's talk about the key mechanic of this system, realignment. Oftentimes in the Iowa caucuses, what will happen is that the supporters of a certain candidate will not meet the minimum viability threshold, and then they are allowed to vote for a second choice. So this means moving over to another candidate. This is called realignment, and this is the key mechanic that makes these things so difficult to predict. Now, this could either take the form of people joining with a similar can the, the supporters of a similar candidate to back someone who didn't make the threshold to begin with, or to add support to somebody who's already over the hump and then give them even more support. The keys here for winning voters over, well, one, if they are inclined anyway to like someone as a second or third choice, that helps a lot. But also it's about enthusiasm behind a campaign. People tend to want to gravitate toward campaigns which seem to have a lot of energy. People want to be on the winning team. And also there are strategies that people employ in these sessions to try to appeal to the concerns of voters or to try to win over people who are a little undecided. And as we'll see, there are plenty of people who don't really lean very strongly one way or the other. So a lot of this is politicking in the purest sense possible, but by volunteers who are not themselves professional politicians. I can only imagine what these are like. Um, I've never been involved in a caucus, but it seems like a pretty 
crazy process altogether. Now that we understand the basic mechanics and how these delegates are assigned and how you have to win on realignment, let's talk about the X factors which will determine the winner. And some of these are hard to predict with any kind of accuracy due to a lack of data. The Iowa 2020 caucus has been polled less than the 2016 caucus because unlike in 2016, only one party is holding a caucus. Last time there were more polls because both parties were involved, so it made sense there would be more attention. There's also reason to believe that the margin of error on the polls which have been conducted is higher than one would like. Iowa caucuses have a long history of not adhering to prior polls. One factor here to keep in mind, which sort of blinds us to some extent, is that the Des Moines Register poll, which was supposed to come out either yesterday or today, is unavailable until Monday morning because apparently they forgot to include Buttigieg's name in the survey. So the Buttigieg campaign thought that the numbers were skewed against him and he talked to the paper and they agreed to not release the numbers. Now, whether that is Buttigieg doing what he does best and trying to obscure his own weakness or whether this is a legitimate complaint is anyone's guess. Both are equally plausible. A major factor to consider is that despite the partisan adherence of many people to their candidate of choice, a whole lot of Democratic voters really don't have a strong horse in the race and they're just willing to go with the flow they're of the vote blue no matter who variety. Now I don't I can't really put a number to that, but there are quite a few of them. And of the people who have said that they prefer one person or another, half or more of them are self supporters who would be willing to back someone else and wouldn't really lose any sleep over it. So this means that candidates who have more hard support, people who are ride or die for them, are more likely to do well. This also um, will speak to the enthusiasm factor I talked about earlier. Other X factors are when the candidates prove to be unviable. And yes, I know technically, according to Wikipedia, the term is inviable, but that's not a word. So Iowa caucus, change your archaic bullshit phrasing. The word is unviable, not inviable. So for the candidates who are likely to prove unviable, the four I picked out here are Gabbard, Steyer, Yang, and Klobuchar their supporters will then have to realign with other candidates. And we'll get into the fact that both Yang and Klobuchar could potentially manage to secure a delegate or two, although I think it is quite unlikely. Now, could they in a few places hit that 15% marker? Yeah, but again, if you think about how many total county delegates there are and how many you would need to win to ultimately end up with one national delegate, you have to keep that in mind. So don't get too excited about the fact that some of these precincts are near college campuses, Yang people. I've heard a lot of very overexcited Yang people making some pretty bold predictions and the mechanics of this race do not really allow for those predictions to come true, barring catastrophically bad polls, which have underestimated the support to a criminal extent. So there also are a couple candidates I have my eye on who might end up underperforming in ways that are embarrassing and they might fall below the viability threshold and then have their supporters reassigned. And those two candidates are Pete Buttigieg and Elizabeth Warren. Those of you who have been following the race know exactly why those two could potentially be very weak. Now that we've dispatched with the preamble, let's get into my official prediction. Bernie Sanders will finish in first place. I will not hazard a guess as to the numbers in terms of the percentage of the vote or the number of delegates he ends up with in the end. I think that the thing which will put him over the top, one, he has the enthusiasm, crowds show up for him. He also has done a lot to organize. He has as of November, actually, so it's probably more now, he has 1,000 trained caucus volunteers to go around and get people behind him. And he also has had 44,000 people in the state, and again, this is November, donate to him or in other ways participate in his campaign, which is by far the most involvement and participation of any candidate. That kind of participation is absolutely vital to winning a race like this. Plus, 
Gabbard definitely won't be making the threshold, so her delegates will have to realign. Their main issue is anti-war. Bernie is the only other candidate who has a strong stance on that. So that 2 to 3 percent who seem to support Gabbard will go to Bernie. And while that is not many people, that's still enough to potentially make the difference in a close race. It seems that Yang has also basically given his permission for his supporters to back Bernie if he's not viable at a given site, because he said a lot of his people will end up backing Bernie, um, which is kind of a tacit endorsement. I, I think if he hadn't said anything, this would still be the case. But since he basically suggested it, this means that this will be more the case. And Yang is closer to that threshold than Tulsi. He's probably more at about 3 to 5 percent, somewhere in there. So if you add those together, that's potentially about 8% of the vote. And of course, these people won't actually vote in a block. This is a, uh, but these two candidates in particular are more likely to operate in a block because of the cohesiveness of the people who support them. And Bernie could also pick up some stragglers from other candidates who fall by the wayside, especially Steyer people, who in theory should at least be somewhat attracted to progressive rhetoric since Steyer can talk a good game. And there's also the I want to be on the winning side factor. So if he starts pulling away, some people might just jump on board. Some of the undecideds because they want to be on the winning team. That's actually a real factor in these kind of elections. It happens all the time. And even in general elections where people aren't standing around and debating who to vote for, um, there is a uh, bandwagon effect. So I think that Bernie has the right edges to pull this out. Second place. It has to be Biden, I think, um, although I could see Biden, Warren, or Buttigieg finishing second. I think Biden has the strongest case for going second. And the reason is that he's got a strong default. Now, he has been sliding, as Tim Black famously says, Biden is sliding, but he's still managing to hang on. And if he's in one of the races where a lot of the other centrists have fallen off, Biden is likely to pick up some stragglers. He has that default support, which I think will translate fairly well in a caucus environment. People have a certain level of comfort with him, despite some of the concerns people are starting to have now due to his stance on Social Security and the increasingly difficult to ignore signs of intellectual decline. In third place, I have Warren. Initially, before today, my instinct was to put her in fourth or possibly even fifth. She has been sliding very rapidly ever since she tried to go after Bernie on the women can't be elected line. But now she might have a last minute boost because she did get the Des Moines Register endorsement. And while that doesn't sound like a big deal, this one actually does matter. Um, Des Moines Register has often picked the winner of the debate, I mean, not the debate, the caucus, and it has a lot of sway over a large swath of Iowa. And I don't think this would be enough to put her over the top by any stretch of the imagination, but it could arrest the decline and maybe win her back a few people. It's also possible that um, she has a good chance of picking up the most Klobuchar people. Um, Klobuchar people are a combination of centrist and people who are just obsessed with identity and they want a woman. Warren's campaign at this point, she shed a lot of her progressive support due to being a worse progressive than Bernie and then her ill-timed attack but I could still see her pulling in third place. Fourth place, and the only other person I see as almost a lock to win at least some delegates, Pete Buttigieg. The problem for him, and the reason why I think he will actually underperform his poll numbers is simple. If you look at him as a candidate, if you're someone who's trying to vote strategically, and there are a whole lot of people in the Democratic Party who vote strategically rather than what they believe, um, the too clever by half voters is what I like to think of them as. You have to understand that Pete is simply not viable beyond New Hampshire. Those are the, there are only two states where he has a viable campaign with any support, Iowa and New Hampshire. He has basically zero support among all um, people of color. If you look at every group, he's got basically zero support there. There's a certain unviability with Pete Buttigieg, which I think is obvious. So while he will have his supporters, I can't really see too many people realigning to join him 
because they are probably aware that he has no future beyond this caucus. That being said, the default support he has right now, or not default support, but the existing support should be enough to get him something. In the races where he doesn't quite make it, his supporters will have a hell of a hard time trying to get other people to join with them. So there will be quite a few of these meetings where he doesn't get Jack. Um, his voters, I think, would be more likely to side with establishment people. And actually, the thing that would be most likely to put Biden over the top would be if Buttigieg has an unexpected collapse. Say if that poll, that Des Moines Register poll, ended up being accurate, because I assume it has to be catastrophic for Pete, otherwise he wouldn't have wanted it out, right? So if that ended up being accurate, that could be the thing that actually makes Biden squeak it out. Klobuchar is, of the minor candidates, the one most likely to be able to make the cut enough times to pick up a delegate or two. I think her ceiling is about three delegates. I've heard a few people, like Chris Matthews types, try to claim that she has a chance of shocking the world and winning the whole thing, I have to call bullshit. There's no way. Klobuchar is not inspiring, and I can't imagine that her supporters are any more charismatic. I can't imagine them winning over a broad coalition in these caucuses and, you know, really shocking the world. If she gets a delegate, maybe up to three delegates, I wouldn't be surprised. If she gets zero, I wouldn't be surprised. If she gets more than three, then at that point, I would be stunned. The only other person who has a chance at all to win any delegates is Andrew Yang. I have one friend who believes he will finish third. I have another friend who I don't know what his prediction is, but I bet in his heart of hearts he thinks Yang will somehow win. It's not going to happen. Um, I would say that Yang has a very specific ceiling in this race, and that ceiling is one delegate. One national delegate, I mean. He does pretty well among the college demo, but he doesn't dominate it the way that Bernie does. So in the university towns, he might be able to get some of the county level delegates. And that might be enough to get him a delegate, but in every other precinct, I don't think he's going to have the viability. And I know the Yang people like to talk about how the polls are skewed against them. I have no doubt that that's true, but they would have to go from about three to 4% in the polls up to 15 or more. As we discussed, some of these thresholds are higher. And that is hella unlikely. Another thing he does have going for him is a little bit of enthusiasm. His supporters are very enthusiastic. That could help um, if they um, are trying to take over certain sites. So like I said, if he, wins a, if he wins a delegate, I would not be stunned. But if he doesn't win any delegates, I would be even more um, not surprised. I also will go on to predict that um, Yang choosing to spend so much time and money in Iowa was a massive mistake and that this is more or less what has sealed his fate. I mean, he didn't have a very good shot anyway, but I think that this was the nail in the coffin for him. He should have gone to Nevada. As for Gabbard and Steyer, they have no chance. Um, I can't be persuaded otherwise unless they absolutely stun the world and finish first and second somehow, um, which would then make me feel like a crazy person. So what will be the impact of Iowa? A lot of years, I think that the importance of Iowa gets overblown just because it happens to be first. In 2020, however, I think it could be vital. Although as this race has worn on and the establishment has really failed to choose their champion, I think that Bernie has a somewhat broader path than simply having the steamroll three out of the first four primaries. That would still be the ideal path, and if Bernie is able to pull out Iowa, then this puts him in an excellent position to have a lot of momentum going into Super Tuesday. I think he could still eke out a win without Iowa, but if he does lose, he needs to make it as close as possible. As for Biden, this is something that could staunch the bleeding and make the establishment rally back around him. Right now, it seems like they're searching for other champions. Bloomberg um, and Klobuchar seem to be the ones that they're floating right now. And there are also a lot of rumors about Obama possibly secretly supporting Warren and trying to get the party apparatchiks to back Warren in order to stop Bernie. But if Biden is able to win, then maybe this staunches the bleeding and get, gets his campaign back on track. 
by the way, Bernie has taken the national lead in most of the mo more recent polls on uh, the national numbers. If Buttigieg manages to win, this will be really interesting, um, but it won't be interesting for him. Buttigieg could extend his campaign by winning in Iowa. It would then make him finish better in New Hampshire, although I think at this point New Hampshire is more or less locked in for Bernie. He's up by 12 over his nearest competitor. I don't see that gap closing in a week. So um, if Buttigieg wins Iowa, then this effectively might confuse the establishment some. And uh, for Buttigieg, the reason why he can't really do anything with the victory in Iowa is simply because all of his national support, at least half or more of it, has gone to Bloomberg, who spent a quarter of a billion dollars to purchase that support directly from Buttigieg through his overwhelming ad buy campaign that you can't escape no matter where you go. Um, so Buttigieg, if he somehow manages to shock the world and win these caucuses, it wouldn't help him, but it would change the dynamics of the race because it would then cause the establishment to have to rethink its own strategy and possibly that confusion could then give Bernie a, um, a good chance to rally the non-establishment people even more. Actually, of all the candidates who could win and damage Bernie the least, Buttigieg is that guy. So as a Bernie supporter, if Bernie doesn't win, I actually hope Buttigieg wins, even though I absolutely hate Pete Buttigieg. And a Warren win could possibly change everything. She's been sliding for a long time. But as one of my friends pointed out, one thing she has going for her is that while there are a lot of people who aren't crazy about her, there aren't really that many people in the party who hate her guts. And I, by the party, I mean both the people in power and the voters on the ground. So if she could make a strong showing in Iowa, this could create a comeback for her. Now, it would be a long road for her to climb, but it might be possible. Of course, in a general election, she would have very little chance, but we're talking about the primary. As for a strong Klobuchar showing, say if she gets all three delegates that I think she could get in theory, well, then this could help to edge out some other centrist earlier. Let's say Klobuchar performs well and then Buttigieg does shittily. At that point, we might see Pete depart right after New Hampshire whereas Klobuchar might stick around to try to wait for a Biden collapse and then try to emerge as an alternative or make a VP um, gambit. But those are the potential impacts I see depending on how the outcome turns out. This has been Thersites the Historian, and within about 36 hours of this video's release, we will know whether or not I called this right or whether I was completely and totally off the mark. I'll see you around.